Well, we're here on part two of this blog topic. Uh, what was the name of it? Blog topic five. About the only two commandments in the new covenant. One to the unsaved, one to the saved. So it says that's why the New Testament commandments are absolutely not burdensome. Like the 613, can you imagine? Old Testament ones. tired guys I have this terrible sinus thing going on from mold I um, put these sheets out on the plants a couple nights ago in the wind and I didn't have my respirator on and I'm very allergic to mold so but uh, that's why the New Testament commandments are absolutely not burdensome like the 613 Old Testament ones were and why Christ's yoke, it's called crestus. It doesn't mean easy. I don't know why all these Bible translations do this easy thing. It means custom fit or tailor made. You know, a harness, a yoke, is what attached two animals together. Think of a carriage, a horse-drawn a horse -drawn carriage has this bar that's um, with all this leather that's around the um, animals link, you know, linking it to this bar so they can work together in tandem. So it's custom fit. So it's not going to chafe them. It's not going to hurt them. It's not going to bruise them. It's not going to cause any uh, rubbing sores. Uh, no, none of this. So it's custom fit to us. It's tailor made. And he says his burden or load. And in context, this is the Old Testament. Um, sorry, the, the commandments. Right, rabbis could bind and loose. So it's talking about commandments. And his burden or load, easy to carry. It's super light. It's really the word light. Light to carry. So it's very easy to carry. So God is living on the inside of us by his Holy Spirit to help us carry the load. That's what it's really about. That's why he called the para, he's called the paracletos, because he's beside us. Close beside us. It's para means close beside, like parallel. If we meadow remain connected to the vine of Christ so that his holy and righteous life can flow through us to bear much fruit for God, you know, it's a big if. For certainly no, our experience is that without him we can do nothing. So this is, um, he's saying that this is something you have to do. If we remain connected, uh, then, I should say, his holy and righteous not life can flow through us. It's a really if-then. And there's verses for all this. So, see this thing, I had this vision about abiding, and it's really powerful about what abiding means. You can also see the holiness page, sanctification. So there's a holiness link there. A Christian's focus in life need no longer be on what to do to be more right with God. That was an obsession, right? The Old Testament people were just under this obsessive focus, right? Should not, not be that anymore. And they were just so concerned about what to do, what to do, what to do, what to do, right? What to work, what to do, right? To be more right with God. That's, that's why it's called works of righteousness. But our focus can now be on the who of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. To, here we go, experientially, relationally know. That is the new focus. That's the new obsession. More and more each day. It's no longer about getting it all right. But about getting to know the one who is always right. Isn't that obvious? 
this, that's just so obvious. It's not about getting it all right because Jesus' blood covers us all, cleanses us, takes out all our transgressions. So it's really, this is what it means to be free in Christ. You're free. You're not, you know, bound to this, having to worry about every little I, left, not, you know, dotted, every little T not crossed, you know. There's a big difference. That's, that's freedom. So there's a lot of notes on this, so you want to go look at that. Our trusting, relying faith in Christ has already secured the victory, having made having been made, declared uh, righteous, justified, right? With assurance that the righteous one and his parakletos advocate, the Holy Spirit, right? Intercedes daily for us in the courts of our Father God. That's what it says. You know, the accuser of the brethren is there accusing us. But he intercedes for us. Christians are now free from the horrible burden of always trying and often failing, then always running and hiding from God, and thus always wondering if they should fear Judgment Day. Yes, free, right? He says, we, yes, we are free. He says, the sun, if the sun makes you free, you are free indeed. Remember that? He said, if the sun makes you free, then you are free indeed. That's John 5 something. So we should remember that. It's, this is a real freedom. When the sun makes you free, you are free indeed. And we know from the passage there, it's talking about freedom from the slavery to sin. But not by going back to living in sin. This is not how we get free. It doesn't say, hey, now you're free to sin, do anything you want. But by being made ma madly. <laughs> made, sorry. It's by being madly in love with God. Right? Being madly in love with God. This is, this is what we get into when you come into the Lord. You, you become madly in love with God in gratitude and letting him live in us righteously, righteously, right? He lives his righteousness in us by his Holy Spirit more and more each day. The Holy Spirit. So this is just a surrender, right? A day-to-day -day surrender him. The Holy Spirit, he's more concerned with the relationship than the deeds because he's already covered the deeds. I know it's hard to understand that. He's covered it all. So the Holy Spirit is who makes it possible to confidently, conversationally prayer, pray. This is where we're talking and listening. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, that's what, who makes it possible, right? No, you're just not praying this and there's no possibility for it to happen. The Holy Spirit is the one that does this. That's why Jesus tells Christians, uh, third, I think it's like 11 verses later, He says to routinely, well, where is that? It's in math, it's in Luke eleven thirteen. Luke eleven. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done is eleven. And we'll just see one through thirteen. Thy kingdom come is verse two. So in thirteen, yep, eleven verses later. To routinely, that's the key, or habitually, that's the present participle, iteo, that is petition with confidence. Petition with confidence. Boldness, right? That's what it means. There's a whole bunch of words here uh, to, to demand, right? So this, that's a powerful word, I tell, is to petition with confidence, bold confidence, like a child, right? Boldly coming before their daddies and jumping in the bed. <laughs> Lord, Lord, show me. You know, you could just go in and jump in his bed. This is a loving father. So for the agathos, agathos means God-like good. This is not just any kind of 
good. This is God-like good. There's a 17 words to describe this good, which is the grace gift of the Holy Spirit. God-like good. And I look at verse 13, the Bible gateway. Yeah, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. So that's what it's talking about. Uh, the good gift of the Holy Spirit and this is also in Matthew 7, I think, 11 or something like that. Um, so, yeah, gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow, isn't that awesome? The Holy Spirit is is who makes it possible to confidently pray, right? Thy kingdom come, thy Holy Spirit, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why Jesus uh, tells Christians 11 verses later to routinely, habitually petition for this good gift. This is, this is a routine thing. This is not a once, once in a while thing. It's the only way the kingdom of God can come in to your life on earth as it is in heaven. So contrary to what so many people have been taught, the two greatest commandments of the Old Covenant, which is to love God, right, with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the Pharisees, like, tried to trick them on that, so they add, added mind <laughs> with your intellect, with your analyzing mind. <laughs> they added that. He didn't even take the bait. Uh, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the two greatest in the Old Testament. That the 613 uh, Old Testament law commandments and the prophets depend on, well, are in no way, shape, or form the intellect commandments of God. No way. For the completely different in kind new covenant. Because by definition, it is... Fresh, completely different in kind, unprecedented, sharing nothing with its predecessors, unique and superior. So you want to look at Logos, Word of God, blog topic 13. We've already said some of this in previous blogs. Jesus never taught, it's very interesting, go look at it, that Jesus never taught the Old Testament commandments to his disciples, but in fact explained to the Jews the inadequacy, the inadequacy of them. He explained, hey, these are inadequate. You know, the Hebrews says, the book of Hebrews says that the old covenant was flawed. That's why it demanded a second covenant. So he explained to the Jews the inadequacy of them, as with loving your neighbor as yourself, since neighbor was defined as, quote, those of like status, giving Jews the out to hate the Roman Gentiles, their enemies. Whereas Christ's commandment to unconditionally love one another as just as, he says. Now, this is not as yourself, but just as I have unconditionally loved you. See the difference? Big difference. Jesus is now the example to follow, not ourselves. <laughs> ourselves are seriously flawed. So you can see uh, that one has boundaries, and you know, neighbor as yourself, you know, kind of boundaries. And but this is clearly without boundaries, right? This is godlike love. This is this is uh, without boundaries. This is the New Testament gospel, right? The logos message of the truth of God, which is called. The law of Christ, or Paul calls it that, or the perfect law of liberty where mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's what James says. So they're referring to this commandment of Christ. So when the other New Testament teachers refer to love your neighbor as yourself, you say, well, wait a minute. what about Romans 13, 9, Galatians 5, 14, James 2, 8? You'll see, you know, Things are always determined by context. You take something out of context, you get some wacky zoid uh, doctrines, and people do that all the time. 
But if you look at it in context, it's always to stubborn Jewish Christians, stubborn Jewish Christians, not Gentiles, to point out that their unloving behavior not only is in disobedience to Christ's Logos message, they pride themselves in being Jews, right? But also violates the fundamentals of their own law, right? That, they're, that they so cherish uh, the yoke of slavery, Paul talks about. That the teachers of the law, right, they want to, them, these Jewish Christians, they want these Jew, Jewish Christians to turn back to, to try to convince them to go back to, right, back to these worthless, uh, weak, beggarly, poor, and destitute Right? ABCs, he calls them ABCs, Stokian, destitute, rudimental, fundamental, uh, rudimentary, fundamental principles of this world and all its religions, the Jews included, whose slaves you want to be once more? Really, he's just baffled. However, Christians who are not under law, but under unconditional love and favor of grace, he says, Christians are not under the law. For he ongoingly takes or lifts up or abolishes, uh, this is a word, an, an ira, which means takes or lifts up or away to abolish or abrogate, this is a, a word, an narrow, iro, an iro. The first covenant in order to establish the second covenant. That's in Hebrews. Because the first was flawed. It was faulted, blameworthy, rejectable, and condemnable. It was it, it's worthy to be, you know, done away with. That's that's the force of this word, right? It's faulted. It's wor it's there's blame to be made here. Right? It's rejectable and it's condemnable. And thus, he says, paleo, which means made obsolete, ancient or obsolete, made ancient or obsolete. Right? So he's made it obsolete. The new covenant, which is superior by definition of Chadash and Kainos, which is Quote, a better. Now, that's really a downplay. And, and better is an understatement. Cret Cretan means a lot more than that. So, uh, you can go look at these verses. It means more useful, serviceable, helpful, better. So, it's, it's, it's very much more useful. A better covenant in every way, it says. Also, carries absolutely nothing from the old into it by definition. It's um, completely unique, unprecedented, and one of a kind. That's what it means. So we can't keep borrowing stuff from the old and bringing it into the new. It's just, it's, it's really illegal. <laughs> it's a patent term. You can't steal stuff from previous inventions and bring it into the new invention. So I have a, a reflection as Christian musicians. If we are going to base our lives on doctrines of the New Testament, Shouldn't we be building them from the truth, right, of the original Greek and not on poor English translations? There's 900 of them. Which one are you going to choose? Religious people have confused and deceived so many Christians in believing that the Old Covenant law is still active for Christians and that the Ten Commandments, or at least the two greatest ones, of loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself should be strictly obeyed. I've heard this a thousand times. But the New Testament doesn't teach this, but actually the opposite. The law failed miserably due to the weakness of man's flesh. Our flesh is still weak. It's still flawed and was replaced with a completely different and kind new covenant. That's why it was replaced with two completely new covenants, commandments. Trusting, relying, faith in the Son. You won't find that in the Old Covenant. Every Old Covenant commandment is, if you do this, you will have life. But the problem is, the flesh was weak. It can't do any of them. 
So trusting, relying faith in the Son, and coupled, unconditionally loving one another just as Christ did. And that's key. Just as Christ did. Not as yourself. What a terrible example. <laughs> the first is to the saved. Right? The first commandment is to the saved to be saved. The unsaved to be saved. You see? The first one to have faith in the Son who sent us is to the unsaved to be saved. And the second to the saved to live a sanctified and holy life pleasing to the Father. That's, that's the other part of salvation. Salvation is a process, right, of being made into the likeness of Christ. There is only one work, one form of obedience in order to be saved. There's only one, and that's faith in the Son. It makes it really clear this is the work of God. Only one thing, to have faith in the Son. There's only one labor, it talks about, or service for the saved, to show they are Christ's disciples. He says, by this, you they will know that you are my disciple. And that is unconditionally loving others as Christ walked and lived. This proves that something's changed inside you. And this is now possible because of our surrender to routinely asking for the beneficial grace gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we can live this Christian life is the Holy Spirit to empower us to desire and work God's pleasure so his kingdom can come and his will can be done in our lives as it is in heaven. Our faith, you know what? I think most of the struggles that Christians have, myself included, is that poor, a lot of poor teaching. A lot of poor teaching that didn't get this across. And so we try to mix our work, our might and power, trying to do this on our own, Right? We try to do, I'm going to pause this for a second. So, thanks. So, I think the problem that we all have is um, that we get into trying to work for God. We're so concerned about, you know, obeying the Lord. And we try to do this on our own. And we just can't do this. Jesus says you can't do anything on your own. You don't have the ability. Your flesh is so pitiful. It's so weak. All you can do is have a relationship with me. Make that your focus. Abide in me. Stay connected to me. That's meadow abiding in the, in the vine. And then I will take care of the rest. I produce the fruit. You just carry it. You just bear it. I produce the fruit in you. So it's something that you don't really hear preached a lot. And it's because a lot of religion in, in the church, lots of religion, a lot of old covenant concept. But the new covenant is about the Holy Spirit working in us and making our total focus, our obsession, this relationship with Jesus. And this is now possible because of our surrender to routinely asking. We should always be routinely, habitually asking for this beneficial grace gift. It's, it's God-like, right? It's a God-like gift. Of the Holy Spirit to empower us to desire and work God's pleasure so that his kingdom come right so that his kingdom can come and his will can be done it cannot be done any other way in our lives as it is in heaven this is this relationship this deep relationship with the Lord our faith working through love is all that counts for anything See, it's no longer, and this is a relationship through our love, is that the only thing that counts for anything, our horizontal loving service to others is only possible if we meadow remain connected through the patient endurance of faith. This is trusting, relying faith to the vine of Christ. We have to depend on the vine of Christ. See, it's trusting, relying, depending. See, a lot of people don't even know what faith means. It's not a mental agreement. It's not doctrine. It's this dependence on the vine of Christ. Our life of righteousness is only possible if we remain in Christ's righteousness. 
He's righteous. He's the righteous and holy one. By the spirit of holiness. He said holiness comes from the Holy Spirit. So close examination shows that Jesus, Paul, and James never taught the Old Testament commandments, but actually used them. They do call on them. They use them. They cite them. They quote them. They actually use them to prove more important New Testament truths because the Old Testament is just a shadow. It's a fuzzy shadow. You know, go outside. You look at a shadow. I don't know whether that shadow is my saguaro cactus or the shadow is my Akatia cactus. I, I ha can't even tell, right? If I didn't know the reality, the substance, well, it says the New Testament is the substance or reality, right? And the actual things that they were talking about are just shadows in the Old Testament. How much can you know about reality? By looking at a shadow, and yet we have people obsessed with trying to get lots of truth out of the Old Testament. Wow, that is talk about barking up the wrong tree. They're spending all this time on the Old Testament. When Jesus said, I fulfilled it, hello, the whole purpose is for you to come to me, it says. That's the whole point. It says they testify about me. So it's kind of a wacky world that we live in. Um, it's a wacky religious world, too. So, this uh, Anero, where is that Anero again? Okay. A N O O. E N I R O. So it's this idea of lifting. It lifts up. And Ireo. Yep, and Ireo. So we got to understand the New Testament was not written in English. If you're going to build doctrine, heaven forbid, don't build it off English. Go look at the, uh, you know, it's, it's a disaster. So he says, thank you, Lord, for, this is my prayer, for ongoingly lifting up or a way to abolish and abrogate the first covenant in order to establish the second covenant. Thank you. you. You did away with the first because the first was faulted, blameworthy, rejectable, and con condemnable. And thus, paleo made obsolete. It's made obsolete. The old is obsolete. What are we studying the old for? To study fuzzy shadows? That's literally what it means. You literally nailed it to the cross. He says, I nailed it. I nailed the scriptures, the handwritings against you, so you would, uh, could, so we could forever be free from its power to inflame sin, condemn, and death, right? Condemnation and death. Now we can serve you by no longer, but no longer, no longer, Paul says, by grama writings, no longer, by grama, where we get grammar, or grafe scripture. That's the books that they're put into, or scrolls. But by the Holy Spirit, one teacher and power of God to work in us your will and good pleasure. One teacher and the power to do it. Wow, isn't that awesome? One teacher and the power to do it. Talk about simple. By the same enabling power living within us, we, we will patiently endure in our trusting, relying faith and ongoingly serve others with unconditional love just the way you did. It's all dependent on our relationship. Thank you again for keeping it so simple that little children and the least among you will get this first before the so-called wise and understanding ones. Wow. It's so simple. So look forward to your comments below and we can learn that way from each other. See, body ministry, 1 Corinthians 14 is all about. I just start the conversation you guys keep talking about it amongst yourself. Learn, learn from each other. I learn from what your comments are, so we're all learning together. I try to do exhaustive research, you know, so I, I feel confident, you know, pretty confident 
exhaustive. I mean, thousands of hours, you know, five Bible colleges. A lot of this is, you know, dissertation material stuff. So I try to do that homework. <laughs> I really try to dot my I's and cross my T's. But everybody makes mistakes, you know, no matter how hard you try. So that's why we learn from each other. God bless you. All right, look forward to it. Bye-bye.